So welcome back. Um, the next speaker is Giovanni De Felice, who will talk about joint work with Di Lavore, Roman and Tommy. And uh, the title of the talk is Functorial Language Games for Question Entering. So please go ahead, Giovanni. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about some joint work with uh, Elena Di Lavore, Mario Roman and Alexis Tumi, and hopefully they're around in the chat. So if you want to ask them questions during the talk, uh, they'll probably reply. Okay. Let's see. If, yeah. So, so I want to talk about applying category theory to linguistics and in particular to computational linguistics. As you know, linguistics is the study of the scientific study of language and and language is a really hard, hard system to study. And so it's, there's a lot of things that we don't understand about language. And so linguistics is kind of split up into a lot of different subdisciplines where we can understand language at, at different levels. And I think there's, I mean, so for instance, like you can look at language at the subword level, looking at uh, letters, syllables, sounds. Then you can look at how words compose to form sentences how sentences go into text or used in dialogues. Uh, all of these different levels, there's like some specific fields in linguistics that tackle them. And I think there's a good potential for category theory to be used in, um, to kind of, to translate between those levels and to make them collaborate towards a better understanding. So what do we know from a categorical perspective? To some extent we so the first thing that we kind of know well is syntax and there's been a lot of work on syntax in the 20th century starting with categorical grammars by like the work by Jukovic and Bar Hillel in the 20s 30s 40s then in the 50s Chomsky introduced his hierarchy of context free grammars uh, of grammars and in particular context free grammars were applied to language and at the same time Lambeck was developing uh, uh, the Lambeck calculus, which was a, already a unification of categorical grammars. Lambeck is one of the pioneers of category theory and, and all of their, his formalisms are very suited to categorical formalization. And so later in his career, at the end of his career in 2007, 2008, he introduced preview grammars, which simplified a lot of his uh, previous work. And that's the one that You've seen Costantino, Smarta, uh, and everyone talking about basically basing on pre groups or on the Lambic calculus. But all of these uh, formal grammars that I've mentioned can be understood as instances of three monodal categories. So after syntax comes semantics, and the idea, the, the principle behind semantics is that the meaning of a sentence should be given by the meaning of its words and the way in which they are combined together. So categorically, this means that that meaning should be a functor from this free monodal category encoding the syntax to some semantic category. And even though the concept of functorial semantics was already there uh, since the Lawier's work in the 60s, Bob and uh, Mernouche applied it to, to linguistics uh, in 2008 also with uh, Steve Clark, and you can see the reference here. But then there's been, it, this started a whole field which is known now as DiscoCat. And, and, and you've seen also a lot of talks about uh, syntax and semantics and this DiscoCat. So, so what we don't know very well is pragmatics. And pragmatics starts from the simple observation that the meaning of a sentence depends on the context in which it is used. So the same utterance water, for instance, can be a request to a waiter, the answer to a question, or the lyrics of a song. In this work, we're, we're going to try to, I mean, in this work, we tried to go towards pragmatics. And we did some first steps towards uh, understanding language in context. And in order to do this, we need some kind of intuition to analyze language from this perspective. And luckily we have, uh, we have philosophers that have been thinking about language before us. 
in particular Wittgenstein in the philosophical investigations, analyzed the, this contextual or pragmatical aspect of language using the concept of a language gain. And he never gives a general definition, he defines it by example. So here I'm citing asking, thanking, cursing, greeting, praying. So this concept of a language game is kind of pointing to a range of restricted situations where the language we like, where there's an analogy between the way we use language and the way we play a game. So, so we use language towards a goal and we, we utter sentences in the same way that we would play moves within a game. So right now, actually, I'm, I'm playing the game of scientific communication. That's an example. You can play it in many different ways. And Bob is a good example of a good player. So now, um, so the idea is to take this concept and use it for understanding uh, language in context, or like for at least isolating some parts of language that we can model and we can do some science about. So this idea comes from uh, this paper by Jules Hedges and Martha Lewis towards functorial language gain uh, in 2018. And, it's, and the aim is to use this concept to bring together categorical linguistics, which I've described uh, before, and compositional game theory, which, well, there's been quite a few talks about compositional game theory. I think it's, it's quite recent, 2015, 2016, and it was built by Shul Hedges, Neil Ghani, and other collaborators, and it's become one of the main, one of one important branch of uh, of ACT. So, in this work, we build from this uh, paper by Shul Hedges and Martha, and towards uh, pragmatics and question answering. So, let's go into the into the maths. So first I'm gonna start by introducing compositional game theory. So the idea is the framework is a one monoidal category where the objects are pairs of sets like X and S here. And an open game from XS to YR is something that takes observations in X, produces moves in Y, and it takes some utilities in R and produces some co-utilities in S. So, so the data for defining an open game is a set of strategies, sigma, a play function that takes a strategy and an observation and produces a move, then a co-play function, which given a strategy that the player is in, an observation and a utility that he's getting, feeds some co-utility to the environment. So this S is gonna get fed into uh, the rest of the game and it's gonna be utility for other players. And then, you have the equilibrium function, which says how given a context, which is given by some observation and some way of turning moves into utilities. It tells you what is the best response in this context or the set of best responses in this context, which is a set of strategies. Okay. So you can think of, we have a nice diagrammatic representation for these open games. We have a covariant part and a contravariant part. And we can now use these boxes to comp these building blocks to compose them and form bigger games. So here is one simple example. It's a question answering game. In this, in this example, F is going to be a set of facts. T is going to be a teacher, is, is representing a teacher. S is representing a student. And M is representing a marker. So you start, the teacher starts and he observes a set of facts, say, reading from a textbook. And he uses this, these facts to form a question together with its correct answer. And the question is given to the student who uses his strategy to answer the question. And so you get, you get an answer for the, the student. And then the marker compares the answer of the teacher, the answer of the student, and gives some utility to both. And it gives some utility to the student if he, uh, answered the question correctly. And to the teacher, he gives the opposite quantity so that the teacher is incentivized to, to trick the student or make hard questions. Okay, so let's keep this example in mind. For the moment, it's a bit abstract. So we're just using sets and, and strategies are just functions, but we're gonna make it more concrete later on. 
For this, we need to go into categorical linguistics. So starting from grammar, a pre-group grammar is a tuple where you have a vocabulary, a set of basic types, and a dictionary. So the, the dictionary assigns to each word a type, which is an element of the free pre-group generated by B. And this already Constantinos uh, spent some time explaining. I think most people should be familiar with this. Uh, but uh, let's look just at one example. So this is a determinant. It has type D. Sentence is a common noun. So it takes an, a determinant on the left and produces a noun. Makes takes a noun on the right, a noun on the left, a noun on the right, and produces a sentence. And sense is a noun is of type noun. And, and then in this diagram, you can see that this string of words is grammatical because because of this diagram. So you can think of the, the bottom part of the diagram, so these caps, as a proof that the sentence is grammatical because it's a morphism from the string of types to the type S. Okay, so we can reason about these sentences in one big category, which is the free rigid category generated by the dictionary entries in this way. Okay, so now let's get into semantics. As I mentioned before, and as uh, you've seen also in other talks during this conference, a disco model for a pre-group grammar is a rigid monodal functor from this grammar category that we've defined before, the free rigid category over the dictionary entries, to some semantics category, which has to be a rigid monodal category because we're going to have to interpret the caps and caps into this semantics. And so in this, in the sense, uh, the semantics of a list of words with some grammatical structure given by a morphism in this category is given by its image under the functor. So to look at some, some examples, distributional models arise by taking that to be the, to be the semantics. And these were the first one to be introduced and they've been studied a lot. Also relational models are very interesting because uh, they correspond to relational databases. You can think of them as a way of translating sentences into conjunctive queries and then of evaluating conjunctive queries in the category of relations. Uh, this, this is what we did in the, a paper that was, that was presented last year at ACT. And then you have also quantum models, which is what Constantinos talked about in the last talk, which arise by taking the semantics to be the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, and this is leading to the development of quantum natural language processing. Okay, so we are gonna uh, we're gonna propose two ways of of making categorical linguistics and, and game theory interact. The first way comes from Jules and uh, Martha's paper, and it's the idea of building functors from grammar to games. Now, game is not a rigid monodal category. And so, and this already was noted by Jules, and, and so in order to build non-trivial games, you need to find a trick. So one way was that Jules and Martha proposed was to change the syntax. So get out of the pre-group grammars and then you can interpret directly into games. And another, the way that we're proposing to do this is using a really nice proposition by a really nice theorem by Antonin Delperge, which is in his paper in 2014 on autonomization of monoidal categories, which was also presented last year. And it basically gives a way of, of interpreting pre-group grammars or rigid categories in any monoidal category. And that comes from the fact that there is a free completion from monoidal category to rigid categories called the autonomization which basically takes a category and it freely adjoins caps and caps. Like the caps and caps are just seen as syntactic, uh, as syntactic morphisms that you add to your category. And then the, the interesting part of this result by Antonin is that the embedding from the monoidal category into this bigger rigid category where you freely adjoin the caps and caps is full. It's faithful because it's an embedding and it's full. So being full means that if you have a morphism in G, and you have a functor from G to A of game, 
so the autonomization of this monodal category, such that the input and output uh, of your morphism are in the underlying monoidal category, then you can recover a morphism in the, in the category and in the sense that all the snakes, all the caps and caps can be removed. So let me show you a little example here. So Bob who is rich loves Alice. This is a grammatical sentence. That's the, the grammatical structure of the sentence. And now we're gonna basically remove the snake. So the first step, this, this is generated in, in this copy. So the first step is to apply a functor that factorizes each box. And this already Constantinos was describing. And then the second step is to, is because each box in this, um, in this new, honey, Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah, okay. Can you switch your slides in a moment? Go oh, back. I want to see the, yeah. Because there's, uh, okay, let's see. Please go on, let's see if, uh, if we you have problems, because there was a problem with seeing the slides. Yeah, but I'm kind of, I'm moving out of the slides into some, into something else. So into this that is generated in this copy. So can you see this? So, no, no. So please, ah, okay. you have to share the desktop, <laughs> not just the window. Okay. Ah, share the full screen like this. Can you see? No. No. So please okay. unshare your screen. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, it's I mean, okay. we I can. We can work that out. I already showed this. I can show it uh, later. No worries. Absolutely. I can, can I keep it going? As you prefer. Okay. So the main idea there is that, and already Constantino described it, so I don't really need to go into it to, in too much detail, but basically a sentence, you can obtain a monoidal diagram from a rigid diagram. You're going to see an example straight up. So we're going to use it to model a simple, example that was given in uh, the philosophical investigation. Let me just read uh, Wittgenstein directly. So the language is meant to serve for communication between a builder A and an assistant B. A is building with building stones. There are blocks, pillars, slabs, and beams. B has to pass the stones in the order in which A needs them. For this purpose, they use a language consisting of the, of the words block, pillar, slab, beam. A calls them out. B bring this, brings the stone, which he has learned to bring as such and such a call. Conceive this as a complete primitive language. Okay, so that's the, the example. You have this builder, you're in this building site, you have a builder asking or giving orders to his apprentice. And the, so he, here's an example of an order, bring large labs. And the idea is, th is that with this procedure going into A of game, you're gonna basically unsnake this sentence. All the snakes are gonna be removed and you're gonna be end, up, end up with a diagram like this one. Bring, so slabs goes into large, goes into bring. And then you can interpret bring as, a, as an open game, which takes an observation, which is just a noun phrase. And it produces an order by just, by just uh, composing it with bring. And then it waits for an action from the, from the apprentice. The apprentice is modeled by a map that takes orders into actions. And then the full sentence is gonna be mapped uh, compositionally to given a continuation. So the equilibrium is modeling what the, what the order, uh, what, the, what the builder wants uh, and what he's satisfied with. So, the image of bring large jobs is gonna take a continuation K and return one. So if, uh, if the apprentice uh, hearing the order bring large labs, he performs the action to bring large labs and then the, 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 the builder is satisfied and zero otherwise. So that's a very simple basic example of how you can use the uh, of how you can use these functors to encode the pragmatics already within the syntax of the, of the diagram. So let's go now to the second way that we uh, wanted to put these two theories together. So recall the, the game that I've described before. Now we can instantiate each of those sets and those maps with respect to some pre-group grammar. So F, the corpus, is going to be a list of question-answer pairs. 
where the, and the teacher is going to just take uh, strategies, pick one of those question answer pairs. This we do for simplicity for now. But the main idea here is that the student strategies are going to be disco models. So he just has a finite amount of data, which is the functor that goes from this free category G to the category of relations. And the basic type, so such that the image of the basic types is the set of possible answers. And in fact, we are also asking that the questions are grammatical sentences in G. So now the student just has a model, a, a disco model, and given a question, he just applies the model to, to answer. He has a set of possible models and he has to choose which, which to use to answer. Okay. So from here now, it's, it's uh, easier to compute the possible outcomes of this game. So the first case is that the teacher wins because he has a question that the student cannot answer, okay? So the student doesn't have access to the model that answers the question correctly. The second case, which is where the student wins, is if he has a, a, a functor that answers all the questions correctly, and this happens uh, if, if the corpus is consistent and the student has access to this, to this model. So the corpus is consistent, is basically equivalent to the existence of a model or of, of, a, of a functor that answers all the questions correctly. And then we have a third case, which is like a matching pennies scenario, where basically the, the teacher, for any choice of the teacher, the student has a model that answers it correctly. And also for any choice of the student, the teacher has a question that, that he cannot answer. So in this kind of matching penny scenario, this happens if the corpus is inconsistent. And it also happens if the student uh, only has access to to some kind of local, uh, locally uh, coherent functors, but no global. So he doesn't have access to the full functor that explains them all. Okay, so these were the first the steps that we that we made. Some small steps, but uh, I think conceptually, it's uh, some interesting steps because. Basically, what we want to think about for future work and going towards applications is that we should think of language games as NLP tasks, as natural language processing tasks. So here I'm going to give a few examples and with uh, two bullet points. Yeah. I think um, we should wrap up in a few seconds. Yeah, that's the last, last slide. So I'm just going to give three examples very quickly. So. First of all, you can think of word sense disambiguation as a collaborative game between words uh, where their strategies are word senses. Second, you can implement this uh, question answering game that we've, that, we've, uh, maybe in this that we've just described, maybe in Discopy, maybe in CatLab, and implement a generative adversarial network for modeling this game. And finally, the last game I wanted to, to, present, to, to propose is a is to have the same game, but with one teacher and two students, where the teacher is quantum, and one student is classical, the other one is quantum, and, uh, and then you can do quantum supremacy by saying that the student that's quantum wins over the classical one. Thank you. Okay, I'm done. okay thank you. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time for question answering um, oh. but um, sorry about that but I think we should move on uh, to the next talk okay uh, but um, let's thank, thank you. Giovanni again thank you